All right, everyone. I think I'm going to kick us back off. Welcome back. There's a ton of great conversation happening in Slack, so if you're not over there following along, highly recommend it. But we're ready for our next talk. Outages really suck. I think all of our past speakers have spoken to outages and how bad they can be, especially what a strain they can be on people. But our next speaker, Marco Coulter, is going to be talking about why you need to be equally as concerned about slowdowns. Welcome, Marco. Thank you, everyone, for showing up. When they finished the TV show Orange is the New Black, um, I decided we needed to repurpose the phrasing. At the time, I was reading about how we were getting fewer application outages than ever. And I wondered if we had no outages at all, then what would we worry about? And that's when it occurred to me that slowdown is the new outage. Hashtag sit note. What I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to cover three key areas. We're going to consider what the differences are between outages and slowdowns and why slowdowns are the new outage. I'll give a brief hint around the costing of slowdowns, estimating those costs, and then we'll get to the main event of how do we how we gain insight from existing monitoring and what that means so that you can automate actions to resolve slowdowns. And at the end, I'll give you a few hints of just preparing for slowdowns, preparing your organization to manage and address slowdowns and some links for further reading. So I'm just gonna push out a quick poll here. If I can, we'll start with this first one. So I want you to think about Oh, I've got to answer it myself, apparently. Oh, my shrug is gone. So, so I wanted you to think about how you react if someone said your primary application experienced an 87-hour outage. And my first answer here was going to be a shrug. But anyway, so we have, you know, would you just raise a ticket and move on? Would you start a war room? Like 87 hours is a long time. Would you panic? Would you start selling off your company stock? So if you can sell, submit your answer to that um, while we're chatting here, and then I will come back in a few seconds and address the responses from the poll. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce myself. Sorry, a few little challenges. So I'll come back to the results of that poll in a second. So first, um, well, g'day, I'm Marco. I'm an immigrant who's lived in three countries uh, my career spans from coding for one of the top 50 uh, international banks, managing data centers for hospitals while part of a services company and leading product and engineering teams across 13 countries. Most recently, before joining AppDynamics, part of Cisco, I, I spent five years as an industry analyst leading the data science team at 451 Research. I've seen technology from every side. I've been a vendor, an operator, a developer, an analyst, and a buyer. Um, people seem to value that unique outlook in, on this industry. And what we see here are a few of the places that I've been interviewed on the left-hand side and where articles have been published. So that's enough about me. Let's get on to the topic here. So what are the differences between outages and slowdowns? Well, let's start by understanding the nature of them. Outages refer to a period of time that a system fails to provide a perform or perform its primary function. So it gets caused by things like crashes, you know, system failures, code crashes, network outages, that sort of thing. Outages aren't cheap, by the way. Uh, Gartner sees the average price of outages having risen from about $42,000 for an hour outage back in 2004 up to around $300,000 for an outage in 2014. The thing here is that there are fewer and fewer outages every year. Thanks to RAID and cloud and better hardware and, and also on the practice side to DevOps practices, site reliability engineering or SRE practices, uh, chaos engineering, resiliency practices, outages are becoming a rare beast. We know that outages lose customers for us, but what, when the, what about when there's no outages? What will cause customer loss? Well, that's where slowdown becomes the thing we need to focus on. But to understand this alternate threat, Let's compare the two, and we're going to, I'm going to start here with outages. So the thing we know about outages is that they're obvious. When that farmer accidentally plows through the fiber cable that connects your remote location to the city center, um, it causes your outage. Your application is going to go down immediately. When the, we're in New York here, we're right in the middle of a thunderstorm at the moment, so don't be surprised if you hear some noise. The but if a power blackout takes out our cloud provider, the application is going to go down immediately. System icons go red. 
and the customer experience goes red at the same time. There's no confusion here. Your app is down. You know it and your customer knows it. So that gives us a couple of characteristics around the nature of outages. The first one is that they're immediate. A few minutes ago, everything was working. Now it's down. They're an it's an immediate impact. And people notice, you know, the Slack channel catches fire, Jira tickets start appearing, um, your cell phone starts mo vibrating off the desk. They're very noisy when an outage happens. And because of how they hit us, because of all the noise and the immediacy of it, they trigger a panic node. Uh, uh, so a little bit that Matt was talking about this morning. They trigger this reaction of drop everything else and just focus on that. Now, I have worked with engineers who actually enjoy that moment, the adrenaline dump in your body and, and that singularity of focus. Um, they sort of enjoy that sort of thing, but it's not necessarily good for the organization as a whole. The other important thing about them is that they're not necessarily a single event. Um, the single event is just the last straw that breaks the camel's back. So often for an outage, there are other things. There were parts of the system that were allowed to run without failover or technical debt that was ignored for too long. So if those are the characteristics of outages, then how is that different from slowdowns? Well, slowdowns are subtle. You know, the DBA adds a new parameter that makes the SQL call just a little slower. Perhaps the infrastructure team sees that generally that Kubernetes cluster is only running at about 60% height, so they take a pod or two out of your cluster, and that just means that with load, it's just a little bit slower. Or one of my personal experiences, that manager who practices their juggling on the race floor near the back of the, rack, the network rack, well, they loosen the connectors, and it's not enough to break the connector. It was just enough to add some errors into the regular traffic. And those error correction packets going back and forth just made everything a little slower. It's just a millisecond here, a millisecond there. And on any given screen, you're just going to see a little bit of yellow. But the key difference here is what the customer experiences. And while each team, each silo is seeing a little bit of yellow, the customer's gone red because they're getting the accumulation of all of those slowdowns in their customer experience. And then how do they react to that? Well, again, it's sort of subtle. They're not going to think it's an error. They're just thinking you expect them to accept that sort of response time. So they're just going to delete your app. They're just going to close that web page and move on to somewhere else where they hope to find a faster one. You will lose the customer and not even realize it. So slowdowns are commonly a resource constraint. There's not enough of a resource. You're using the resource poorly or there's contention for the resource. Something's locking other things out. Um, if you have too many network transactions on a narrow bandwidth, or if the system memory is filled with unnecessary locked pages, a slowdown will result. So what are the characteristics then of the slowdown? Well, what we see is that each of the pieces builds together into the poor customer experience. The slowdowns are incremental. There isn't a clear it began on this moment and it stopped on that moment. It tends to be more that various changes gradually build up, but damage your customer experience. The second aspect here is that, as I say, the, the phones don't vibrate with the text messages. The customer just deletes your app. They're not going to phone up and complain. They think that that slow experience is what you want to offer them. So they're just going to make the judgment on you without reaching out to you. They're silent. The slowdowns are silent and subtle. Because they're commonly a resource strain, there is a good side to it. Because they're commonly resources, you can fix the experience by throwing more resources at them, right? So you're not really repairing it, but you're addressing the experience as long as you know what aspect is causing the constraint. So if it's memory, you can throw some more memory at it. This is where automation can be especially powerful because where APM sees a slowdown, the AI ops engine built into the APM piece will identify, and let's say it identifies it as low memory. We'll run with the memory example as the root cause. And yes, I said root cause. I know we can have the debate in the Q&A channel later of is that a good phrase or a bad phrase. But let's call it, assume it is. So low memory is the root cause. You can trigger an immediate action to expand the memory allocated to the pods inside your Kubernetes cluster. You can address this without solving it. Why would you? Well, because that then gives you the breathing team. Now your, your SRE team or your DevOps team has some breathing room to work out, 
okay, was this caused because we have a memory leak in that latest update or because the marketing team finally came through with you know, a really great campaign and you're getting flooded with new customers? It might not be a bad thing that you have this load and this load, you know, this usage of resources. So that's the third one. You can address it without solving. And then the fourth one here is that as we talk about outage of the final straw that sort of broke the camel's back, well, slowdowns include everything, every aspect of the customer experience. So slowdowns are, in fact, the entire camel. So should we care about slowdowns? Well, I'm not going to get... I mean, if you're not getting abusive phone calls from a random executive, should you care? Well, that's a good question. So let's look at a way of putting a value on slowdown so that we can understand why we're going through this. Now, I'm not going to go through the full costing process here. Let me just walk you through an idea that you can then run within your enterprise. Uh, I apologize in advance for my oversimplification. But consider this next section sort of like the grain of sand that you can take in your environment and turn into a pearl. So as we look at the nature of slowdowns and the cost of them, let's just play with some numbers here. Um, so I'm going to start with an outage cost as the first example, rather than a slowdown. So if you were an SRE and you had a 1% error budget in your environment, well, what does that give you? Well, there's 8,760 hours in a year. Um, and for before people flame me in the chat room or something, I understand in an, it, we're in a leap year right now, so it's actually 8,784. Um, but let's run with 8,760 just for the sake of it. So if you've got that and you've got a 1% error budget, and let's assume that you're running 24-7 throughout the year and your revenue you know, comes in equally every minute of every day. I, I told you, I warned you I was going to oversimplify. Well, if that case, if you have an application that brings in 100 million in revenue over the year, that means that a one hour outage is going to cost you about $11,427. That error budget, that 1% error budget is about $100,000. So what about slowdowns? So let me ask you a question here, and I'm just going to try swap back over here to look at the poll responses. Oh, we've pushed out the next poll. Okay, so looking at the next poll, how would you react if someone said your primary application was experiencing a 100 millisecond slowdown? And again, they've taken my shrug out of the responses here. Maybe there was only four responses available. Um, so would you just go, meh, I don't care. You know, 100 milliseconds here, what, who, what's the stress? Would you raise a ticket? I've dealt with it, I raised a ticket. Would you start a war room? Let's work out what's going on here. Would you panic? Would you sell off your company stock and say, yeah, this, we're never going to survive the 100 millisecond slowdown. Let's get out of here. So I'm going to give you a second or two to run those responses. Okay, if we can close out that poll and bring it back. Now, in your interface, you can look at the difference in reaction to between these two things. When I asked you about an 87-hour outage, most people, 48%, the plurality here, said they would start a war room. 23% said they'd panic, and 18%, almost one in five, was selling off company stock and options for that 87-hour outage. When we asked the question about the 100 millisecond slowdown, 74%, far and away, the, the majority said they'd raise a jury ticket. And only about 4% were looking at selling off the company stock. So there's a reason I've chosen these two numbers in this way. So as we worked out, a 1% out, a 1% error budget is about 87 hours. It's the 87.6 hours in a regular year, not a leap year. Sorry, folks. So let me return now, just a few clicks here while I get back. And let's go to what we need to do as we measure slowdowns. The trick is finding the right metric to start with. Now, as this is a public presentation, I went out and dug out a public metric. You know, if we were working with you, we'd be consulting and, and working out the exact numbers in your application and your revenue. Um, this one's a few years out of date. A few years ago, uh, Greg Linden, from the, who is the part of the Amazon team, he worked out that in the checkout process at Amazon, their retail stuff, that every hundred milliseconds of delay cost them 1% of sales. So if the overall trans, you know, process got 100 milliseconds slower, 
they would lose 1% of business because people would abandon their carts. So let's use that as our sort of rubbery number here as our starting point. Obviously, it's going to be different for you in your environment. Then we come to estimating the slowdown and we see, you know, I've thrown in the same sort of you know, calculation numbers here, but what would a 100 millisecond slowdown cost? Well, if we're using his number, if that 100 milliseconds ran through the whole year, what you would be seeing is a 1% loss of revenue through the whole year using that number as the basis. That is exactly the same as the 87 hour outage that we were talking about. Has the same financial revenue impact on your business, on your company, on your enterprise. But think about, go back and look at those two polls and look at the difference in reaction of how we would react to them. Now, sure enough, an 87 hour outage in the middle of the outage room panic mode, the 100 milliseconds, you know, is it running the whole year? Well, you won't know unless you're looking, unless you're looking for the slowdown. And that's why I think that slowdowns are so important. They're silent killer. They're this subtle thing that happens in our environment. But the only way we can see that the, you know, the business impact can be the same, we have to be able to see the changes. So those were your actions. You know, maybe you have a quality of service SLO. Well, would you care then? Or maybe you have an agreement with your, with your business side, the you know, the slowdown budget is often calculated as a function of average load. So the business side agrees that when the load increases, it, things might slow down. Whatever it is, for all of those responses, it means that you have to be aware that a slowdown is happening. And that's where I go, okay, even if you say slow may be good, but it's not down, it's not unavailable. The problem is that down is obvious where slow is subtle, and we have to look for it. So now let's kind of move on to, well, how do we address this? What are the, some of the things that we need to go forward? Well, if you think about observability, it kind of, it's defined as giving you, I think, the capability to reach into the code and answer an unpredictable question. And, and I think the most important word there is unpredictable. The whole thing with slowdowns is you're not going to know where it's going to come at you. The metric you are not watching will get you. And with slowdowns, you need insight in order to resolve them. It's not just going, here's a metric. You need those metrics in some sort of context. You need the context around what you're observing. So first, let's look at some of the challenges for slowdown diagnosis. Now, as we look at the challenges, let's start with some of the tools that were sufficient for the complexity of last decade are not sufficient anymore. The nature of our applications and the environment that they live in has become significantly more complex. So for single applications on single machines, a D-trace or manual breakpoints can be fine. Um, but in distributed systems observability, Cindy Shadaran notes that they will often fall short while debugging distributed systems as a whole. And the experience of people out there is showing in surveys. In late 2019, Logs.io ran a survey and they saw 73% said tracing was critical to observability, but only 19% were using it. So why this disparity between, you know, what they thought is important and what they were using? Because in use, they realized it was informing them, but not giving them insight. When we're trying to diagnose that sort of complete customer experience, relying on multiple business transactions, living in distributed, multi-cloud environments, well, the basic telemetry falls short of insight. So in comparison to that same survey, by the way, about 87% listed monitoring as critical and almost double the number of people have already implemented it. Um, and I even noticed, I'll bring it up again later, but um, I noticed in the Google presentation earlier from Jennifer that you know the bottom of the Google pyramid for SRE is monitoring. It is the most basic place that you have to have in place for everything else to be successful. Um, this is the survival. You know what? Monitoring is the survival mechanism for the cross-application business transaction. So having got this far, what are the things that we look for, you know, in your tool set? What does your system need to give you so that you can actually get that insight and be addressing slowdowns appropriately? So this is my checklist. The good news is that some of your existing tools can help as long as they meet these sort of basic needs. So the first thing is you don't want to be guessing what thresholds to set. You already have a day job. You want to set the system to automatically baseline for you to work out what normal looks like. 
The second one here is that for, to diagnose things, you need a segmented metric view of a customer business transaction, not just the end-to-end -end point, but the piece, you know, the amount being consumed by each piece of the transaction, so that you can diagnose where the issue is. You want to be able to isolate when you find out that it's in code. You want to be able to isolate code portions within the production environment. And one of the things here I mentioned before, the important thing was the unpredictability of this. You know. You can try and set feature flags all through your applications in case you need them to switch on monitoring later on. You can try and set, you know, well, you can't set breakpoints in production applications or you'll crash your application, but there are systems now that you can set watch points. So dynamically in live environments, you know, at AppDynamics, we do this through our deep code insight option. We dynamically set watch points around production code, allowing us to work out where the coding error lies without having to rebuild and resubmit the application. Your other aspect here is that your customer experience lives across your entire enterprise. It travels across silos. And so your metrics have to be cross silo as well. You need some sort of lingua franca, some common language that everybody can look at and accept. Um, I'm just thinking of his name now, the gentleman from Digital Oceans. He mentioned about dashboards and, and how dashboards are, are so incredibly useful you know, while you're in the middle of solving a problem, that's when you want to have something that simply visualizes the environment for you. Now, it would be possible to switch on lots of diagnostics and lots of metrics and things and completely overload your system. So that's why you need to also have overhead minimization. So when performance is new, normal, what do you care? You know, you're not going to be looking at it when it's normal. But when something goes astray, you want to get detailed snapshots when that anomaly happens. You don't want the, the monitoring system to back off. You want it to drill down at that point in time because that's what you need to deeply understand. And speaking on anomalies, you want a cognitive engine. You, you know, we have fantastic machine learning now. Um, you want an AI ops sort of filter to filter out the noise of those momentary issues so you can focus on the real deal. That should be connected to a, an AI ops system that can automate those sort of complex and mundane reactions so that you don't have to. So make sure that you're looking for these features as you, you know, look, put together your system or create your processes and environments to prepare for slowdown. But it's not just about technology. We also have to, oh, this slow, this, the title of this slide is wrong. It should be saying preparing for slowdown, not slowdown characteristics. That was a cut and paste error. Sorry about that, folks. So preparing for slowdowns. To detect slowdowns, we've got to see the broader picture of the total user experience. All right? You should be able to visualize the entire user experience for any transaction with, with a simple click. I'm looking at this transaction. I'm looking at a different tra One click, I'm looking at a different transaction. You won't have the time once the slowdown is impacting business to decode the transaction flow and, and work out what the dependencies are. Ensure your system already gives you a complete view of the user experience. And that might even be across, um, across systems that are not technology. Like, you know, perhaps the business, the user experience is a, you know, an IT transaction, an IT transaction, a physical process and another IT transaction. Well, you need something that can see, view across and track all of that because that's the user experience. That's the only thing that matters. Um, and by the way, I'm giving a, I'm going to talk about T-shaped skills in a second. I'm giving a webinar next week on the impact of the pandemic on digital strategies. Uh, I'll, I'll post a link in the chat room and in the in the Slack QA so that you can you can come and join that webinar if you want. Um, but one of the key propositions uh, that I'd look for in new hires is their ability to comprehend the complex aspects of where their applications live. So when I started in the tech industry, it was really important to be a very skilled expert in one area. If it was in the infrastructure teams, you know, there was a, they were a networking person or a database person and they never crossed over. They didn't understand what that other team did. In development, it was this language or that language, or maybe they were front end specialists versus back end specialists. And they never really understood what was happening on the other side of the fence or what was happening in infrastructure. We can't be that anymore. We still want to keep the depth of that eye shaped skill. Yes, you'll still be an expert in a thing. But you need to build a capital T shape. You need to become a, a sort of like a skin level expert or a skin level optimist, if you like, in all of those other areas so that you understand the complete picture of how your application runs. We've got to be able to take a step back and see that overall picture. And I emphasize at the start, 
resolution needs insight. You need to exploit machine learning to filter the noise and provide the right context so that you get that aha moment where you suddenly see how the constrained component is slowing things down. And that aha moment, it gives you the, now I know what action to take. Or once you've seen it before, you will automate the action. So yeah, I mean, Julius was talking about this from the, from the overall viewpoint. Uh, Julius Zerwick from DigitalOcean, he talked about how dashboards are more informative during incidents. So during normal, eh, you know, cute. During the incident, you need the dashboard to simplify and focus you. And then Jennifer from Google was talking about monitoring being the base of that SRE pyramid. And my last piece of advice here is to remember that in all of this, and, and after a couple of decades in this industry, the metric you don't watch is the one that's going to bite you. I guarantee it. It's always that thing that, so as careful as you can be in putting breakpoints in your code and, and setting up monitoring and pushing logs out in the right way, it's going to be the thing you didn't think of that will get you. So with that, I'm going to move on to the next slide for a second, just to give you, there are some further reading links here. They're quite long links. So again, I will post these in the, if you join me in the Q&A Slack channel afterwards, I'll post these in there. Um, and as we come back to it, I'm going to call Jason back into the room and just have a quick look to see if there are any questions sitting up there that I need to address. Thanks, Marco. That was fantastic. Yeah, there actually are a few questions in here. Um, let's pick, uh, so the top one here says, how do you deal with slowdowns that aren't coming from the code? So this is, this is a great question. And this is uh, where I was talking about in the monitoring of where a pro the user experience might be code, code, manual part of the process code. And what you need to do is, you know, you, you, your APM, you, you know, we have a solution called Business IQ that does this. Um, you need to be able to construct that and visualize that into icons on the screen of going, you know, automated process, automated process, manual process, automated process, but still be able to see the whole thing and have timings on them. So when the transaction sort of leaves the code and becomes some, some manual step, you still want a way that when it comes back into code that you can track that process, you know, you'll need some sort of ID or something, you know, a customer ID, something that you can track it when it joins back in so that you can see that entire picture. So it can be, the short version is it can be done. Tracking those sorts of manual processes, it just requires the, a little bit of work or a little bit of thinking about how you're going to connect them together. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, from my time, uh, both doing ops work and from working at Datadog, it was basically the same. I think all of the tools out there, you know, there are so many monitoring tools, app dynamics being a great one uh, where you're at, but no it is really all about, is really all about, uh, you know, getting that context, right? Right. Uh, Having that more information available to, to understand more than what's in your code. Exactly that. Like, you know, every operating system has some good commands that you can pull some metrics out of it. Pretty much most languages have something like that in there, but getting them to build, you know, before I joined App Dynamics, they started with with the APM of just connecting it together and connecting, you know, the, the the code to the infrastructure from sort of the application down in the infrastructure. And then they came out with this thing, Business IQ, to go from the application up into the revenue and the business requirements and, and those sorts of things. Um, and of course, now we're having to go, you know, it's going out into the cloud and multi-clouds and into that structure, that space as well, and back into the actual lines of code and things. That's where the deep code insert comes in. It's, it's a, you know, it's why these products exist, because it's a serious problem, and but there is a solution. I guess that's my, my advice today. Yeah. There's another question here. Is there a formula you use for slowdown mapping into the dollars, assuming you know what that average value is? Um, so so we, we do have ways of calculating that if kind of thing. There, there is a, but that was what I was trying to do when I was break, doing the costing of the slowdown of, of kind of going, okay, well, you need to first understand what the impact of slowdown is on revenue. Without that, you know, you, you can't do the rest of the calculation. Um, that's why I use the example of the Amazon one because it's out there, it's in the public. So, you know, there's no problem in sharing that sort of number. I'm not going to share customer numbers because they would consider that privileged information. Um, with that metric, then absolutely, you know, and, and again, I simplified it into 24-7, 365 or 366 a year, you know, as many hours available. But 
you know that every you know you'd know from your own experience jason that every hour is not the same when it comes to how the revenue is coming in and, and what the impact is you would want to calculate that into a slightly longer formula rather than just going there's this many hours in the year a slowdown of this many seconds is this much let me stretch that out over a year and see what the impact would be on my revenue absolutely I always recommend that people exercise real DevOps, not the DevOps automation, but the breaking down of silos across an organization. And that means you should go talk to your business people. As an engineer, you should talk to your salespeople and your business people to understand the value that you're providing to the organization. And in turn, that's how you get those numbers. With that, Marco, thanks again for being on, on uh, the conference. Everybody, uh, Marco will be available in Slack. So again, his channel is hashtag QA Marco dash Coulter. Thanks again, Marco. Thanks so much, Jason. Everyone have a fantastic day.